Hello, this is Michael Autos. We are continuing our discussion of circulation, and this is recording part seven. Now we're going to talk about some pathophysiology, and we will focus first on hypertension. Chronic hypertension is defined as a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, and chronic hypertension is lethal for several reasons. It increases the workload on the heart, leading to early heart failure, coronary artery disease, it leads to damage of blood vessels in the brain, which can cause a cerebral infarct or a stroke, and it leads to kidney damage from high pressures in the capillaries. Essential hypertension, also called primary hypertension or hypertension of unknown origin, which accounts for the vast majority of all hypertension. This is often related to obesity, which increases cardiac output, leading to high blood pressures and increased resistance. Obesity also increases sympathetic nerve activity, which leads to hypertension and renin secretion. Increased renin will also lead to increased levels of angiotensin II and aldosterone, leading to fluid retention. Other, uh, other factors associated with essential hypertension are smoking, alcohol consumption, and obstructive sleep apnea. In these patients, that pressure diuresis curve shifts to the right, which means high blood pressure becomes their new normal baseline. And if blood pressure is lower than their new normal, the kidney stops producing urine in order to retain sodium and water and increase blood pressure back to this new elevated level. Treatments for essential hypertension include physical activity and weight loss, vasodilator medications, and diuretic drugs. Patients can have secondary hypertension, which is due to some other disease like renal disease, hyperaldosteronism, aortic occlusion, pheochromocytoma, or pregnancy. A hypertensive crisis is defined as a blood pressure greater than 180 systolic or 120 diastolic. A hypertensive emergency is not based on a number, but it's based on signs of damage to organs. Any organ that's being damaged by high blood pressures would be an example. Encephalopathy, cerebral hemorrhage, acute heart failure, pulmonary edema, unstable angina, aortic dissection, acute MI, eclampsia, and renal insufficiency are several examples. In these patients, the goal is to decrease the blood pressure promptly, but carefully. About 20% decrease in the first hour would be appropriate. Remember, these patients may have a set point which is higher than normal. And so we don't want to shoot for a goal of 120 over 80 in these patients. People who have chronic hypertension will tolerate higher blood pressures without signs of emergency. When we care for patients who have hypertension, it's helpful if we know their normal baseline blood pressure. Remember, patients may be under stress and anxiety on the day of surgery. There are many who postpone or cancel elective surgeries if diastolic blood pressure is greater than 100 to 115 millimeters of mercury, or if they have signs of hypertensive emergency. We should know the patient's home medications and if they took them that day. Most blood pressure medications should be continued on the day of surgery, except perhaps ACE inhibitors and angiotensin II receptor blockers. Patients should be evaluated for vasculopathy and end organ dysfunction. Do they have ischemic heart disease, left ventricular hypertrophy, or diastolic dysfunction. These patients, due to physiologic factors like volume depletion due to their chronically high uh, blood pressure, or loss of vascular elasticity, or baroreceptor desensitization, together with their medications they may be taken, these patients are prone to very significant hemodynamic volatility, which means you may see high blood pressures, you may see a lot of very low blood pressures. Patients who have perioperative hypertension are more likely to have blood loss, myocardial ischemia, and cerebrovascular events. And hypertension is an independent predictor for adverse perioperative cardiovascular events, especially if they have other risk factors already. Induction of anesthesia is a particularly risky time for these patients, as they may develop significant hypo or hypertension. Consider some volume loading if you suspect they may be volume depleted due to their hypertension or their diuretics. Consider intraarterial pressure monitoring 
And short-acting beta blockers like esmolol may help with the sympathetic response to laryngoscopy. Maintenance of anesthesia, it would be appropriate to use sympathetic antagonists or calcium channel blockers to treat hypertension if it's difficult to control. The next topic is circulatory shock. The definition of shock is the inability to deliver adequate nutrients and removal of waste from tissues leading to damage. There are many different kinds of shock. Shock can occur because of decreased cardiac output, like cardiogenic shock, or decreased venous return due to hypovolemia or bleeding, venous dilation, venous obstruction. You can have shock even in patients with normal or increased cardiac output. If a patient has an excessive metabolic rate or they have a lot of cardiac output but abnormal distribution of blood flow so that certain organs aren't getting sufficient blood flow. <clears throat> Remember that arterial pressure does not always correlate with circular, circulatory function. You can have a hypotensive patient who has adequate tissue perfusion. You can have a patient who is in severe shock and has normal blood pressure due to their sympathetic reflexes. So blood pressure is never the main question. The main question is always tissue perfusion. And, high, and blood pressure is just one tool to help us determine tissue perfusion. Let's talk about one of our most common shocks, which is hypovolemic shock. It can occur in patients who have hemorrhage or burns or dehydration. The initial body response is sympathetic compensation. After about 10% blood loss, the arterioles and veins start to constrict, heart rate goes up in order to maintain blood pressure, which allows coronary and cerebral perfusion. As long as the losses aren't too much, this patient can be compensated. They, these mechanisms can successfully return blood pressure and cardiac output to normal levels. And this occurs very quickly. Within seconds to minutes, the baroreflector reflexes allow for sympathetic stimulation. The CNS ischemic response allows for sympathetic stimulation. The body releases epi and norepi to constrict peripheral arterioles and veins to increase heart rate and increase blood pressure and venous return. Within an hour, the renin system is kicked in to release angiotensin II, which further constricts peripheral arterioles and decreases losses of sodium and water. Vasopressin, which is the antidiuretic hormone, will constrict peripheral arterioles and veins to further increase water retention. And over the next 48 hours, other compensatory mechanisms will kick in. There will be better absorption of fluid from the GI tract and interstitial spaces, Thirst receptors will be set off to increase fluid intake, as well as increased appetite for salt. But there occurs, there is a critical point, a critical blood pressure, and beyond that point, the shock will progress and the body will no longer be able to compensate. And the end result will be cardiovascular collapse. This is probably due to ischemia. And when the body becomes ischemic enough, it can't mobilize all of these compensatory mechanisms. The body becomes more acidotic. Very small vessels start to get blocked by agglutinated and sludged blood. Ischemia leads to capillary leakage and cell damage, which leads to further loss of blood volume. Ischemia leads to organ damage of liver, lungs, heart, and kidneys. And eventually the entire system breaks down. Other kinds of shock. There's neurogenic shock, which means loss of vasomotor tone, most commonly seen in spinal anesthesia and perhaps in general anesthesia as well. Or in brain damage, where vasomotor neurons in the brainstem become inactivated. You can have anaphylactic or histamine shock, where there's venous dilation leading to decreased venous return, and arterial dilation leading to decreased blood pressure, and increased capillary permeability leading to significant loss of fluid and protein into the interstitial tissue spaces. Septic shock occurs due to a bacterial infection spread throughout the blood and the body, 
usually due to gram-positive or endotoxin-producing gram-negative bacteria. These toxins cause vasodilation. The toxins in the fever will stimulate a high metabolic rate. Again, we get thick, sludged blood and deposition of microclots, which can lead to DIC. How do we treat circulatory shock? Well, we need to determine the underlying cause and treat that. In addition, patients may need blood or plasma transfusion, sympathomimetic drugs to maintain uh, systemic vascular resistance, blood pressure, heart rate, and contractility. The head down position may be helpful to increase venous return to the heart, and glucocorticoids may play an important role as well. That's the end of our discussion about circulation. If you have any questions, please reach out as always. And thanks for paying attention.